Hello everyone, and welcome to the Chicago, Burlington, and Quincy Railroad in Wyoming. I'm Mark Pruitt, Warland Ticket Agent. Today is April 3rd, 2022, and this is layout update number 29. A lot of different things happened this month, including adding Skyboard behind Douglas, a lot of locomotive maintenance, modifying the benchwork of the Wind River Canyon, and all sorts of other things as well. So I'll apologize in advance for this rather extra long layout update this month. You know, the really funny thing is that even though it was a very busy month, I just don't feel like I accomplished a whole lot on the layout. Let me know what you think. So to avoid this video being any longer, let's get started. The March update finished up with the installation of the Douglas Benchwork. A few hours after I published that update came a cause for real celebration. I hosted my first ever operating session. For nearly 40 years I've been building and then dismantling layouts that were designed to be operated. None of them were far enough along to operate prototypically in even the loosest sense of the word. This is the first time I've progressed far enough to actually have an operating session with a guest. This was a very limited session, with only one person invited to help me test the operational parts of the layout. My friend Kurt was the guinea pig. You see him here switching Empire State Oil in Thermopolis. The main line is only operational from Casper to Thermopolis. The Chicago Northwestern Line is operational from Casper through Riverton to Hudson. I had a local train ready to go to Thermopolis at the start of the session, and a through reefer train ready to go to Thermopolis as well. During the session, while Kurt worked the local at Thermopolis and the return, I was switching industries in Casper and making up the CNW train to Riverton. I was worried that the session would be too short but that concern was misplaced. We ran for about two and a half hours and never did get to the Chicago Northwestern train. There were two casualties during the session. A Mikado and a tank car drifted off the end of the track in Thermopolis and plunged to the floor about three and a half feet below. A locomotive hitting the floor is one of nature's most horrible sounds. Amazingly, the locomotive survived with only minor injuries. The Alesco feed water heater at the top of the smoke box plus one marker light broke off the loco. Other than that, it was unscathed. In fact, once we confirmed that the mechanism itself wasn't damaged, the locomotive went back on the track and returned the train to Thermopolis. After that little accident, I put a clamp on the track to prevent another such calamity. It's a good thing, too. A few minutes later, thanks to my fumble-fingeredness with a throttle, my Santa Fe almost went off at that same spot. The clamp saved it. Oh yeah, and the tank car suffered only the loss of a stirrup step. Despite the near disasters, the operating session was a success. According to Kurt, the equipment all functioned well. There were no derailments, and he reported that he had a good time, which is the whole reason for doing all this in the first place. It will be a few months before the next session, to which I'll probably invite one or two additional folks. It was very satisfying to have someone else enjoy the layout with me, and it's given me new motivation to continue construction. After the session, I was going to start extending the main line east out of Casper to Douglas, but I actually did something pretty smart for once, and I checked the reach back towards Rocky Mountain Drilling before starting. Turns out it will be a lot easier to work on the building before installing the main line past the area. So I took a brief detour to finally embed the structure in the ground rather than have it continue to sit all cattywampus on top of the dirt. That area isn't complete by any stretch, but it won't be too long before it's good enough to start extending the track. At this point, I painted the skyboards I installed in February behind Powder River and Riverton. These were now ready for the backdrop to be added. 
But let's talk about locomotives a little bit first. Two of my three Mikados have been sidelined for repairs for a while. In fact, the only one not showing any problems was the one that hit the floor. The operating session, as abridged as it was, brought the shortage in mainline power into sharp focus. It was time to do some work on the two ailing locos and well past time to do some preventive maintenance on nearly my entire fleet. Some of them have been running for almost 20 years without any work done at all. Unfortunately, I didn't have a locomotive cradle. That last was easily remedied. I spent around an hour building this cradle out of scraps of benchwork lumber and some felt. Total cost was pretty much nothing. I threw together a video of how I made it and posted that on March 9th. March turned out to be a pretty prolific month for videos for me. The links are in the description as usual. I started out by lubricating the running parts of my four Proto 2000 switchers, two 060s and two 080s. Then I moved on to repair one of the mics. I shot this very edited video clip of the work I did on one of the mics. This is the first time I've done any real work on steam locomotives, so I did a few things the hard way and learned the easier ways as I went. For example, I removed the entire boiler to get to the worm to add a dab of grease. I could have simply removed the cover slash retaining plate from the bottom of the chassis and applied the grease to the exposed gear. I'll know that next time. I greased the gears and added tiny amounts of oil to the driver bearings, side rods, and valve gear. I checked all wheel gauges and cleaned the wheels. For wheel cleaning, I scrape off any accumulated gunk using an X-Acto knife, then clean any loose debris and film off of the wheels using a Q-tip dipped in alcohol. Doing the drivers is especially easy since I just let the loco run at a moderate speed and hold the knife and then the Q-tip in place while the wheel rotates under them. These Mikados are first run Broadway Limited Imports products produced back in the very early 2000s. They're the ones with the QSI sound that you sometimes see maligned on forums. I've never had any trouble with mine until recently though. They've always been solid, good running engines. When these locos came out, the back EMF functionality of the decoder was disabled due to pending litigation from MTH. An upgrade chip was offered around 2007 when that lawsuit was settled. Not in MTH's favor, by the way. And I bought one for each loco back then. Now, in 2022, since I was doing maintenance anyway, it was time to install them. Hey, I never said I was fast. Installation was pretty simple. I just popped the old chip out of the socket and inserted the new one. Here's a post tune-up test of one of the mics with the newly installed chip. It ran good before, but with the improved motor control in the new chip and the back EMF now enabled, these beauties run better than ever. Well, two of them anyway. The third was another story. This particular loco was one of those in need of repair. Its problem was a trailing truck that very reliably derailed when backing around even my 30 inch radius curves. Investigation showed that a bit of the trailing truck frame was colliding with the bottom corner of the firebox. A bit of judicious work with a sanding stick eliminated the problem, putting this unit back into regular service. I didn't just focus on locomotive maintenance and repair to the exclusion of all else. I do preventive maintenance on usually one loco a day, then switch over to layout construction for the rest of my modeling day. Which brings us back to Douglas on about the 8th of the month. I'd been all set to start laying track on the new bench work right after the operating session, as I mentioned, but the pause to embed Rocky Mountain drilling into the earth made me step back and look at what else should be done before installing track in the area. Well, the first thing to do was install the power bus along the new benchwork. Two things drove this. 
It will be easier to do this before installing subroad bed and track and my workbench where I was about to start local maintenance was at the end of this new bench work. With the power bus run, I would have a connection to my DCC system right beside my bench work. This would be great to use for testing locomotives while they're in the cradle. Around the 10th, I started installing the skyboard behind Douglas. This would have been possible, but more difficult, if I had to do it reaching over tracks. By the 16th, I had the Douglas skyboard patched at the seams and painted blue. Now I'm almost ready to lay that track. Also in the middle of the month, I started the very early stages of scenery development between Powder River and Shoban. I did the area between the track and the fascia, but progress here had to stop until I could install the backdrop. Behind the curve, I planned to add a slight hill, and installing a backdrop after that was in was not something I wanted to try. Better to do the backdrop before the intervening landforms. We'll talk about the backdrop later. Didn't I say this would be a long video? Let's jump back to the locomotive work for a few minutes. By the 16th, I had most of the locomotives lubricated and checked. Now it was time to tackle the second sidelined Mikado. This one wouldn't be so easy. It has some sort of valve gear problem on the left side that would periodically jam the mechanism when running in reverse, bringing the loco to a screeching halt. Investigating the problem, I discovered that the valve stem, the rod that slides back and forth to move the steam valve, was also bouncing wildly up and down at times. It certainly shouldn't be able to do that. This wild motion was moving the expansion link, the vertical slotted bar, through a much larger arc around its pivot point than it should. Occasionally, the expansion link would swing inboard at the bottom far enough to jam against the main rod. That's what was bringing the loco to a sliding stop. I put together a short video demonstrating the problem and contacted BLI. Like the other YouTube videos, a link is in the description. Here's a hint. It shows pretty much what you just saw in this video, with some text added as silent narration. I went to the BLI Support Request webpage to see if I could get some help. Note the statement at the bottom of the page. This did not look promising. Still, I sent in a description of the problem and asked for any help they might be able to give. Less than 24 hours later, I received a very nice reply. The technician provided a few suggestions for further investigation, but confirmed that they could no longer do work on locomotives that old. I was a bit bummed. The three Mikados plus one Santa Fe are the core of my mainline motive power. To have that cut by one quarter, with little hope of replacing the mic with the bad running gear, would put the layout in dire straits unless I could somehow find affordable replacements. I would dearly love to have one or two of these brass beauties from Sunset Models running around on the layout. I have one of their Northern Pacific Z8 Challengers that they produced some years ago, and it runs beautifully. Unfortunately, I just can't justify the $1,400 cost of the 05, unless... Since I no longer model Northern Pacific, the Challenger is in semi-permanent storage. It cost $1,300 in about 2009. Maybe I can sell it and add a bit to the proceeds to get one of those O5s. Hmm. But for all that the O5 is a beautiful model, it's a 484 Northern and would be a bit out of place on the Casper division. Plus, I'm not sure it would fit on my 90-foot turntable. The 210 2 does by scale inches. The Northern may have a total wheel length just a little bit longer. And that doesn't address my immediate need in any case. I set about searching for suitable replacement locomotives currently in production, then realized the answer was staring me in the face. Way back when those Mikados were in production, I bought all three of the ones that were available in Burlington livery. My dear friend Walt, with a totally unexpected gesture, 
bought me a fourth one in Central Railroad of New Jersey livery. He told me I could repaint it into a fourth Burlington model in the future. I was floored. Those locos were expensive. While I did have the gift out on the layout for a brief period of time in 2007 and 2008, it has spent nearly all of its life boxed. I never did get around to relettering it, though I was still planning on doing so. Remember how long it took me to install those upgrade ships? I pulled the Central Railroad loco out of the box and swapped the tender and superstructure with the wonky one. Voila! I installed the QSI upgrade chip and my Burlington loco was better than new. What did I do with the bad chassis? I installed the CRR boiler on it and put it in the box. At some point, when I have the time and inclination, I'll take it out and try to repair the valve stem and valve body myself. If I'm successful, I'll have that fourth Mikado. If not, I have nearly an entire loco worth of spare parts to use on the other three when the need arises. Oh man, this video is getting long and we're only at the middle of the month. Well, let's continue. It can't go on that much longer. <laughs> when I was building the version 4 layout in New Jersey, I mostly used classic L-girder benchwork, which was about 8 inches deep. Because the Casper track plan has multiple decks in some areas, I needed thinner benchwork, so I went with standard grid construction, which is only 3 inches deep. I brought all that L-girder benchwork with me when I moved, and nearly filled a storeroom with it. I finally decided I wouldn't be using the L-girder benches, so I disassembled them. Here's what was left when all was done. Sure takes up a lot less space. All the plywood strips, and maybe an L-girder or two, I can reuse. As for the rest, it occurs to me that, given the price of lumber these days, I might be able to take the L-girders to a train show and sell them for a dollar a foot or so. That would net me 60 or $70 to spend on something else. Meanwhile, they sit in the garage now. Do I hear snoring out there? Come on, it can't be that bad. And moving right along, when Kurt was here for the operating session and we were both standing in the big space between Powder River and the Wind River Canyon, it finally struck me just how large that space really is. There's enough room that I could modify the benchwork to allow me to model both sides of the canyon at one point, something I wanted to do but didn't think I would be able to. And it won't interfere with foot traffic through the area. By the 20th, I built this bump out section to the Canyon Peninsula. Every bit of this was built with wood salvaged from the disassembled L-girder benches. That work was already paying dividends. This old photograph shows you what I'm going for. The entire width of the river with a bit of the Highway 20 side of the canyon modeled next to the aisle. Should make a pretty neat scene if I can do it justice. Back to Locos yet again. In 2018, I bought an Athern Genesis Pacific, the later run, at a local train show in Merchantville, New Jersey. I paid about 40 bucks. When I got it home and tried to run it, I could hear the motor turning, but the loco didn't move. I discovered a cracked axle gear, so I ordered replacements for all the gears from Northwest Shortline and put the loco and the gears away. You know by now, I never do anything right away. Well, since I was working on locos anyway, I decided it was time to have a go at fixing the Pacific. As I started disassembly of the structure, I confirmed the crack in the gear. This was obviously why it wasn't running. And that's called foreshadowing, folks. I disassembled the mechanism, taking photos each step of the way so I'd have a guide for reassembly. I removed the main driver and sat back to await delivery of the Northwest Shortline puller I ordered to remove the driver. Meanwhile, I borrowed the one Kurt had and removed one driver from the axle, then pulled the gear. The new gear wasn't hard to install 
and replacing and quartering the driver was pretty easy as well. I reassembled the mechanism and put the local on the track, confident it would now run like it should. I applied power and the motor spun, but the loco still didn't move. What the? Clearly, there was something else wrong. Remember the foreshadowing? I disassembled the loco further, this time exposing the worm, flywheel, and motor. Pulling the worm, the problem revealed itself. The plastic press-on ends of the coupling that ties the flywheel to the worm, being made out of the same plastic as the cracked gear, had themselves also failed. Clearly this thing was not designed to last. A quick consult with Northwest Shortline revealed that while they have replacement gears, they don't have replacements for the failed coupling ends. Now what? I spent a mostly sleepless night March 21st turning the problem over in my head again and again, casting about for a solution other than placing the loco in a park on the layout or chucking it into the waste bin. Early the next morning, I had a possible fix. For years, modelers and some manufacturers have used flexible tubing to connect motor shafts to worms in locomotive drives. Maybe I could do the same thing here. The shafts measured out at 2 millimeters in diameter. I found 1.5 millimeter inside diameter flexible tubing on Amazon and placed an order on March 22nd for more than I could ever possibly need. The tubing arrived on the 28th and I was in business. I cut a short piece of tubing and installed it, then reassembled the loco. Getting the boiler back onto the chassis was the most difficult part of the entire process, but finally I had it together. On the 29th, I put the mostly reassembled unit on the track, turned on the power, and held my breath. It ran. It actually ran. I finished reassembling the loco, which included reinstalling the cab and smoke box front, added a coupler to the tender, and installed the decoder in it and ran a full up test. As you can see, the loco pulled a string of seven stock cars with no problem at all. The mechanism is very stiff and there's a lot of gear noise, especially in reverse, but it does run. While the stiffness might work itself out over time, I need to see if I can address the gear noise. The tender also has a tendency to derail because of the very stiff wiring harness that feeds into the tender. In conclusion, this was, if nothing else, a moral victory. But I'm pretty persnickety when it comes to running qualities of my motive power, and as it sits, this thing doesn't meet my standards by quite a bit. If a few more hours of tweaking it doesn't address the remaining issues, I'll sell this loco along with the Elgerters at a train show, with full disclosure of the problems and repairs, of course. And with that, we're finally done, right? Uh, no, but we're getting closer. While I was waiting for the tubing to fix the Pacific, I put together the image file for the Powder River slash Shobon backdrop and had it printed. I was about to start installing it when I realized I still needed to paint the track. I didn't want to mess up my new backdrop with overspray. Of course, to paint the track, I needed to replace all the missing ties at rail joints. This is my absolute most favorite part of model railroading, folks. Um, that's sarcasm, in case you couldn't tell. After preparing what seemed like about a thousand ties, but was really only 60 or so, I set about installing them. I did all the track I installed over the last few months, which was quite a bit. I went all the way up to the entrance to Thermopolis. This included all the visible track in Riverton and just a bit beyond on the Chicago Northwestern line too. I haven't done Thermopolis yet. I taped wax paper over the skyboard to protect it and, using a rattle can, painted all the track over a couple of days. The house smelled wonderful, let me tell you. Following the painting, I cleaned the railheads. 
I ran a single edge razor blade over the rail heads at a very shallow angle. That proved pretty effective in removing most of the dried but not yet hardened paint. I followed that up with a vigorous polishing with a bright boy. I removed the wax paper from the skyboards and was ready for the backdrop. I rolled out the sections and trimmed off the sky on each one. That's a bit tedious, but it only took a bit over an hour to do about 20 feet of backdrop, so it's not too onerous. Here's the first section of backdrop trimmed and ready for installation. With a bit of help from my wife, on March 31st, we got the Powder River and Shoban sections of backdrop installed all the way to the entrance to the Wind River Canyon. Now I can start scenery leading up to the canyon in earnest. We're finally at the end. Anybody still with me? Let me know if I went into too much detail on the locomotives. I certainly don't want to bore you guys. This video was pretty long, but there was quite a bit to go over. I'll try my best to keep it shorter next month. I still have one more loco to perform maintenance on, and I hope to make some good progress on landforms leading up to the canyon this month. I'm also going to try to start a way car project. Then there's that Sidem kit I mentioned last month. And who knows what else I might get up to in April. Tune in May 3rd to find out. Thanks for watching everyone. Stay healthy, stay safe, and I'll see you next month.